This morning in Acts chapter 11, we will read verses 19 through 26. Verses 19 through 26, I will read on verse 19. And would you please join me on verse number 20? And then read every other verse with me down through verse 26 this morning here in Acts chapter 11. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Thank you very much. You may be seated. And this time we'll have an instrumental special. Carol, that's the uh, music you wrote me about. Mm -hmm. Many of you don't know this. 
but every piece of music that is played in this church or sung in this church goes under my thumb for music content, for doctrinal content, and all kinds of things. And Cheryl sent me the, not the music, but the titles, and of course I knew the songs. And I thought, this is good. I like it. And uh, see, why does it go under your thumb? If you've ever been in a church service where the songs sung made doctrinal errors, I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been in a church service where the doctrinal errors came up, but I know all of you have been. And um, I remember when we were in Woodland Park many years ago before we came down here, uh, there was a special that was sung, and I was new. I was a new kid on the block. If you don't want to rock the boat, you know, you might sink the boat. And a special was sung in church that I sat on the platform doing this during the entire thing. And I thought, never again. And Brother Penn was not our song leader at that time. After the service was over with, I walked up to our song leader, which was about twice my height, because everybody's about twice my height. This is literally what I did. I grabbed him by both lapels, and I pulled him down to my level. And I said, from now on, nothing is approved to sing or play in this church until I see it. And I said, not even Amazing Grace out of our songbooks. He said, yes, sir. And we just made a change. And, a, you know, a shepherd is supposed to protect the flock. And there's a lot of really neat songs out there that are doctrinally incorrect. There's one, I remember a song in particular. We've never sung it here. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of music that I have personally ever heard. It was written uh, for a classical guitar, and the person who sang it and played it played it beautifully and beautiful words, I mean beautiful voice, just incredible song. If I name the artist and name the song, you may know it, I don't know, it's quite old, not very old, but old enough. Well, I, it's fairly new, I guess, I guess I could call it that. And the song goes along and it speaks of a symphony in the Christian life, which is just so appropriate until you got to the rest of the words. And it talked about the sacraments that we take for our salvation. And I'm thinking, we don't do sacraments for salvation. Lord's Supper is not a sacrament. Baptism is not a sacrament. Church membership is not a sacrament. The Holy Eucharist is not a sacrament, if you want to put that into a Baptist church. And I thought, you know, that would be a beautiful song to, to have played as a special. It would be a beautiful song even to have sung because of the depth of the words except for the sacraments. So it's never been played here and it's never been sung here. And so sometimes the devil appears as an angel of light. All that to say thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Is it the right time to say Cheryl <laughs> after that? Thank you, Cheryl, for that uh, piece of music today. <sighs> Lord, if you'll help me, I'll do my best to help our folks. I, you know how I battled back and forth on whether or not to even preach this. But, Lord, if you'll help me, I'll do my best to present it because I believe you want it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to bring a message that is simply entitled, and I think last week I talked about punctuation, how important punctuation is. This is another sermon title that needs punctuation in the right spot. Christian, question mark, or Christian, exclamation point. Christian or Christian? There are Christians and then there are Christians. These days, compromise seems to be the key word in Christianity. In order to be popular Christians, we must become politically correct. After all, no one wants to be an offense to anybody, especially in to Christianity. You see, we are we're trying to win the world but not lose the world. Therefore, some have developed the strange philosophy that in order to be a Christian, you must have some kind of a secret, non-offensive, vibrant faith in the Lord. People are secret agent Christians. They're Clairol Christians. If you're old enough to remember the commercial long time ago, they said, Clairol said, only your hairdresser knows for sure, you see. 
So let me ask you a question this morning. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Today there are believers and deceivers. Professors and possessors. Christians and Christians. Hearers and doers. And as I've said over and over through the years, not everything that claims Christ is Christian. It is that part which claims Christ but does not live Christ that ruins the testimony and the effectiveness of those who are very sincere about their faith in Christ. I have quoted Mahatma Gandhi, and I guess it's an exact quote, but I'm not sure. As, as he said, as he was witness to, he said, Sir, I would become a Christian, or I would be a Christian, if it were not for Christians. And that's because there are Christians, and there are Christians. It causes a lot of controversy. In our text, Acts 11 and verse 26, it says that believers were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. The word Christian here is not a word with little meaning, but rather it is a descriptive word of how these disciples lived. The word Christian itself means follower or imitator of Christ. It is used only three times in the entire New Testament. It's used in our text, and it's used at Acts 26 and verse 28, where it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Only times it's ever used in the New Testament. It's used quite loosely today that if you're not a heathen, you're a Christian, but that is simply not true. You see, these disciples in Antioch had earned the name Christian by living as Christians ought to live. Their lives so imitated the Lord Jesus that these folks said they were called Christians there in Antioch. And by the way, I want to remind all of us, they were not called Christians by their friends. They were called Christians by their enemies in Antioch. These folks have come acting like Jesus, and they didn't like it, you see. To the believer, it's a compliment, but to the unbeliever, it was said in contempt. And if you are truly born again, you may or may not be a true Christian. You say, you mean being saved? may not mean you're a Christian. That's exactly right. Just because you know Jesus is your Savior does not mean in any way that you are an imitator of Christ. The word is used very carefully. Within the sound of my voice, there are Christians, and there are Christians? Which are you? Being born again does not make you an imitator of Christ. Rather, it simply makes you a child of God. So, as I have now given the very controversial statements, I want to ask, number one, a question. Do you know for sure where you will spend eternity? Have you been born again? Everyone within the sound of my voice is going to spend eternity someplace, heaven or hell. And I want to say tonight, there are no places in between. There is no limbo you will not find purgatory found anywhere in the pages of this book that I'm holding in my hand right now. Oh, I've read in some Bibles the notes that talk about purgatory and about paying the uttermost farthing or buying the candle or paying the offering or giving the money or whatever it might be to get somebody out of prison, but that does not speak of purgatory, never has been purgatory, never will be purgatory. It is heaven or hell for every person within the sound of my voice. Either you a saint or you ain't. You're on your way to heaven or you're not. You're saved or you're lost. There is no in-between, you see. There's no halfway house for halfway believers. And by the way, there are no promises of heaven for any of those who only partly believe the gospel. To be almost saved is to be completely lost. I want to say that again. To be almost saved is to be completely lost. You're either saved from hell or you're lost from heaven. Good people don't go to heaven 
and bad people don't go to hell. All who go to heaven go the same way. The songwriters have put it this way. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light in the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. I must needs go in by the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God, then I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. It's sweet to know as I onward go that the way of the cross leads home. Jesus said in his own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And there's no way to heaven except through Jesus. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. No other way. No other Savior. No other in between. No one. Only Jesus. And that is it. And when you get that settled, you're well on your way to becoming a Christian. Let me say it again. When you get your salvation settled, you're well on your way to becoming a Christian, according to the Bible. Secondly, I want to say this, that if you are saved, I want to ask this question. Are you living the life that Christ wants you to live? One might say, but pastor, none of us are living the, Christ, the life that Christ wants us to live. Well, I would like to think some of you are trying I'd like to think that some of us are giving it our best. I'd like to think that some of us have a testimony where we're trying to live like the Lord wants us to live. <clears throat> Salvation is more than just a ticket out of eternal hell. It is the opportunity to live the abundant Christian life. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 tell us very plainly that we're saved by grace through faith. But verse 10 says but that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, we're saved to do good works. We're not saved to sit and to soak and to sour in our eternal security and in the blessed gift of salvation. <clears throat> we are saved not just to go to heaven. We are saved to serve. We're saved to do the good works that he wants us to do. The Bible tells us that Jesus went about everywhere doing good. The Bible tells us that if all the books in all the world, in all the libraries that could ever be written could not contain all the good things that Jesus did in his short 33 years on this earth. That's an amazing testimony. You see, we are saved unto good works. And if you are a Christian and are not living the life you're a Christian? I did not say you're not born again. I did not say you're not saved. I did not say I'm doubting your salvation. I'm saying you may be on your way to heaven. Jesus is your savior. God is your father. The Bible is your book. But you're not a true Christian because you're not living the life. The Bible even tells us very plainly that in fact, if you'll take your Bible and go there, I want to show you one of the great truths <clears throat> given to us in the word of God. You see, the, Paul wrote to Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. The Lord knoweth them that are his. But listen to this last part of the verse. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What does that mean? If you name the name, live the life. If you name the name, live the life. That's the admonition. If you know Jesus, live the life that Jesus has saved you to live. 
Very interesting. If, you're, if you want to call yourself a Christian, live like it. Live like it. That's what we're supposed to. An imitator of Christ. Christian. Somebody described it years ago to me saying, little Jesus is walking around. Everywhere we go. That doesn't mean walk around with sandals and a robe. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that all you ladies ought to grow a beard. I didn't get any laughs out of that. Uh, it doesn't mean that any of you ought to walk around and, and uh, have a staff in your hand and, and stand on a mountain and preach someplace. It doesn't mean that. It means live the life that Jesus saved you to live. It's called being Christ-like, you see. So thirdly, I want to say this. And you may be surprised because this is the last point that I want to give you today. It is, however, the longest point that I want to give you today, so don't get your hopes up. No, I'm only joking. I said, number one, do you know for sure where you will spend eternity? If you're not saved, you need to get that way. You're not on your way to being saved. You're either saved or you're not. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to do that because you ain't going to heaven without Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, secondly, if you are saved, I ask this question. Are you living the life that Christ wants you to live? I'd like to think that everybody within the sound of my voice is at least giving it a good shot. Trying. Try and fail and 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 try and fail. The Bible says that a just man will fall seven times, but he'll get back up. As Lester Roloff used to sing, if I fall down, I'm going to get right up. And the truth of the matter is, every one of us, we're going to have failings in our lives. But it doesn't mean that we ought to be quitters, you see. You want to hear a lesson I learned years ago? I mean, many years ago. I guess I was in my 20s. Failure is not making an F. Failure is making an F and quitting. Failure is not making an F. Failure is making an F and quitting. So if you fail, that's fine as long as you get back up. That's how you learn how to ride a bike. That's how you learn how to shoot a gun. That's how you learn how to do it. That's not how you learn how to do parachute jumping, that's for sure. <clears throat> if at first you don't succeed, you're not going to get a second chance, I don't think. But the bottom line is this. You learn by falling. Listen. When I was a baby, my parents told me that I didn't walk real good until I learned how to walk, but I fell a lot. Learning how to ride a bike, I wrecked a lot. I remember one bike wreck I had one time. I thought it was going to kill me. Uh, it, right in front of my house, my front tire got caught in something, turned sideways, and the handlebar hit me under the ribs and knocked the wind out of me. See, did that hurt? I couldn't breathe. It hurt so bad. But you know what? I've ridden a lot of bikes since then. Because I didn't quit. And I kept learning. I kept learning, you see. So if you are saved, are you living the life that Christ wants you to live? But thirdly, you need to decide today to be a Christian and not a Christian. You need to make it a decision. I've said time and again, going to church is a decision. It's not something on Sunday mornings you sort of get up and you're sort of robot around and you just head out the door and then you go to church. It's not like that. It's a decision every time. Perhaps those who are uh, in church this morning someplace or maybe even here, maybe it became a debate in your mind as to whether or not you were even going to be in church. It happens to all of us. It's not something we robotically do. Every time you go to church, it is a decision. And by the way, every time you choose to do something good, it is a decision that you make or a decision that you have made. I think about Daniel in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. He and his teenage friends were taken captive and they were there in Babylon away from their families and away from everything that they knew. And they decided that they were going to have Daniel fattened up with the king's meat and the king's wine. And the Bible says in Daniel 1.8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. What does that mean? It says he purposed. That's past tense. He already made the decision. He didn't have to make the decision right then. 
It was already made. After David got right with God, after committing this egregious sin with Bathsheba, listen to his words in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 13. He says, Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Verse 15 says, You see, it wasn't until David got right with God that God that he could help others to do what was right. But he had to get right with God first. And that's why that little word then is there. Then will I teach transgressors thy way. What did he confess? If you were to go back to Psalm 51 and read the first three verses, you read 12 areas where David had failed. And he got right with the Lord and he asked God for forgiveness. And he says, when he got forgiveness, he says, then I could help other people. Then I could help other people. You see, very, look what it says in verse 15. He says, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. He couldn't do that before. For nine whole months, he couldn't do that. He had lived in backsliddenness and cold heartedness against the Lord because of his egregious sin of adultery with Bathsheba. He says, but now that I've gotten right, he says, if, I, if I'm able to do this, if God will restore me, I'll be able to help other people. And I think it's interesting in Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. I think it's one of the great chapters in the Bible. You know, Peter was saved. Peter was born again. John was saved. These were his disciples. They loved the Lord. They did all that. Of course, Peter was the most outspoken. He had the biggest mouth. He was always the one mouthing off about one thing or another. Some people say that he wasn't saved at this point, but that's simply not true. Peter was a saved man. And it's very interesting when Jesus was talking to him and he questioned Jesus and he, he, uh, he Jesus told him how he was going to die. And Jesus basically, basically said, well, what about John? What about him? And Jesus said, well, that's not, that's not your business. But look what it says here. In Luke 22 and verse 32, he says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. To get converted doesn't mean to get saved. It means when you get your turned, self turned around. When you get your eyes off of Peter and get them back on Jesus. When you get your eyes off of the waves around you and back on Jesus. When you get your eyes off of your circumstance and get them back on Jesus. When you get your eyes off of your own selfishness and back on Jesus. When you get turned around, he says, when thou art converted, he said, then you can strengthen your brethren, but not until then. You can't be a help to them until you get your eyes off of yourself. And isn't that not true today? Up to that point, Peter was not a Christian. He was a Christian. Up to that point, he was only saved, but not a Christian. Up to that point, he knew the Lord and walked with Jesus, but he was not a Christian. He was a Christian. At one point, he cursed and swore and denied that he even knew Jesus. At one point, he denied his church family. He denied his friends. He quit the ministry, walked out on the Lord. Boy, was Jesus right. Because what happened after Peter got right with God? He preached on Pentecost. Thousands were saved on that day. And he became one of the great church leaders of that day. If you're going to decide today to be this kind of a Christian... It's going to take three things. Number one, effort. You got to try with all diligence. You add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and all the things that Peter wrote about. It's going to take effort. It doesn't just happen because you're sitting there. It doesn't just happen because you walked into a church building. It doesn't just happen because you claim Christ as your Savior. It's going to take effort to make it happen. Secondly, it's going to take enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm has a root word, which means uh, to be filled with God. So you're going to have to be full of him rather than yourself. Isn't that what Jesus said to Peter? When you get converted, then you can strengthen your brethren. Peter was full of Peter. Peter was full of himself. He was full of his own selfish desires. But Jesus said, if you just get your eyes off of yourself and on me, you'll do okay. It's going to be taking being filled with God rather than filled with ourselves. And thirdly, it's going to take some excitement. Say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Be excited about the Lord. We have so many sad sack, grumpy Christians today. You talk about grumpy old men and grumpy old women. 
And who would want to have your kind of Christianity? Happy in Jesus, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Though the joy of the Lord is my strength. We're talking about that God gives joy, not just peace, not just salvation, but he brings joy. And a Christian ought to be joyful. I wish I were a better example of this, but I try everywhere I go to say howdy, howdy to everybody that I see. I still do it. I still do it. People walk in front of the church when I'm out on the porch waiting for folks to get here. Somebody will walk by and I'll say, howdy, howdy. If they're walking their dog, I'll say, I said, happy dog, happy dog. And they turn around and say, yep, happy dog. And I'm thinking... Keep him on the sidewalk, <laughs> yeah, please, so you can have a happy pastor, happy pastor. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, I'll say howdy, howdy to folks. If I'm out in the parking lot, somebody walks by, I'll holler at them across the street, and I'll say howdy, howdy, and I'll make sure they hear me. And I, I want folks to say, well, you know, that pastor over there, I don't know that I agree with what he preaches, but he sure is a friendly fellow to me. And I do that everywhere I go. I honestly do. You can ask my wife, and she'll tell you the truth. That's exactly what I do everywhere I go, as long as it's appropriate. I mean, I don't, you don't want to walk into a funeral and, howdy, howdy, folks. How's it going? Well, they know how it's going. But uh, I'll, listen, I'll meet people and I'll shake their hand if they want to shake hands. And had a, 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 one, of our, uh, one of our business tech people here this week, and boy, we had a long talk. Howdy, howdy. Got in here, and when he walked in the building, I said, howdy, howdy. And got his attention. We spent the entire morning together working on something here at the church. It was really a blessing. And then we spent some time talking about personal things and about the Lord. And you know, the truth of the matter is people need to see the joy of Christ in our lives. That doesn't mean everything is going rosy and everything is perfect. My goodness, it's not. And you know that's true. But neither should be walking around sad sack all the time being a bad and a negative testimony for the Lord being excited about the lot that years ago there was a song that came out that my youth pastor sang i never have liked it and i still don't like it but it was called get all excited <laughs> I, I never did i never did like that song but he sang it but i do remember it and he had a lot of joy and i decided a long time ago that i wanted to be a christian not a christian and within the sound of my voice today there are both kinds let me ask you a question which are you if you're going to be a Christian and not a Christian, you'll need to do the following. Let me give you three things and then I'll be done. Build or rebuild your testimony. Build or rebuild your testimony. You ought to have a good testimony, not, not a testophony. So many today have a testophony. They're one thing in front of one person and one thing in front of their pastor or one thing in front of... No, no, no. Build or rebuild your testimony. Number two, execute your plan. What are you going to do to be the kind of Christian that you ought to be? And then thirdly, fix what's broken. Fix what's broken in your life if you're going to be a Christian rather than a Christian. What am I talking about? Fix your broken altar of worship. Just get it fixed. Decide you're going to have that altar of worship in your life. If it's not there and it's not what it ought to be, then fix it. Fix it. That's what you need to do. Secondly, fix your broken testimony. In other words, right the wrongs that you may have done. And thirdly, renew the vows that you once made to the Lord. You know, there was a time in my life when I got saved. That was a long time ago, 1964. But there was a time in my life when I dedicated my life to the Lord. And that was when I was 17 years of age. I was saved for all those years, but I had never been confronted with the idea of dedicating my life to the things of God. So on that day, I dedicated my life in 1973. But I just want you to tell you, I want to tell you something. Though I've never gone back on my promise, I've not been the Christian that I ought to be. And I've renewed that vow a number of times. I've renewed that vow a number of times. Why? Because my humanity floated to the surface. And I needed to get right with God once again. So the question still remains. Are you a Christian? Or are you a Christian? If you went to Antioch. Would someone say. Well those people are like Jesus. 
Remember that was said by their enemies. Yeah, those folks were acting like the Lord. Bunch of Christians. Or would someone say, man, that's the kind of Christian. If that's a Christian, that's what I want to be. Tell me your secret. Tell me where that joy comes from. During these tumultuous times in our nation's history, where do you get that joy? How can you be so happy? As I was speaking with my good friend yesterday, I said, let me tell you what I'm doing during this time. I said, I'm out every day. I'm at the church. We have services. I said, I speak with people. I talk to them. I'm not holed up in my house someplace. And I try to keep busy serving the Lord in one way or another. And I want folks to know that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? You see the difference, don't you? I know I've illustrated it poorly, but the truth of the matter is we're one or the other, and we need to be the one. Shall we stand?